good afternoon one and all at the outset i would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity and making me part of this august gathering in the next 15 to 20 minutes we'll talk about bilirubin encephalopathy a preventable tragedy we'll first go through a common case scenario then we will understand how to risk stratify babies for jaundice how can we prevent jaundice to develop into bilirubin encephalopathy how is bilirubin responsible for causing neurological deficit and finally we'll talk about management of jaundice so here is a baby j who was born to a primary mother at term by normal vaginal delivery antenatal period was uneventful birth weight was 3.2 kgs baby was started on breastfeed and was discharged at 48 hours of life parents noticed yellowish discoloration on day 3 so they exposed the baby to the sunlight however jaundice was increasing and they reported to hospital at 100 hours of life on examination his weight was 2.8 kg palms and soles were looking ectric and there was pallor however there was no evidence of bruising cephalohematoma spleen was just palpable rest of the systems were normal however there was decreased activity and suck was poor donor reflex were also normal blood group of mother was o positive and baby was a positive on investigations hemoglobin was 12 tct was negative and bilirubin was 22 mg per day sepsis screen was negative so baby was started on intensive phototherapy and breastfeeding was continued bilirubin was repeated after 8 hours it had hardly decreased from 22 to 21.5 activity was still decreased baby was started on iv fluids and antibiotics and 12 hours later bilirubin decreased to 18 mg per day and iv fluids were continued so baby was discharged after 5 days of admission on spoon and breastfeeding at a review after 48 hours baby was active feeding well and but had mild hypotonia so this child comes back at 3 months of age and on investigations when we did para he had a bilateral hearing loss so what went wrong here and was it preventable so this child had developed bind that is bilirubin induced neurological deficit so it is always said that prevention is better than cure and same holds true for bilirubin induced neurological deficit how can we prevent this bind there are three major steps first is prevent severe jaundice prevent or predict severe jaundice then once the jaundice has set in prevent it from progressing to bilirubin encephalopathy and finally whenever you identify jaundice you should treat it aggressively and start phototherapy as soon as possible the problem with identifying these babies at least that the signs and symptoms are very non specific there is overlap of signs and symptoms with other common conditions like sepsis if we miss them initially they can progress to stage where even despite best of the therapy the damage is irreversible the commonest clinical score which is used to categorize acute bilirubin encephalopathy is bind score where we assess baby for mental status muscle tone and cry and usually each is given a score of 1 to 3 and a score of 6 or more is said to be irreversible now how does this bilirubin cause neurotoxicity it is the free, free bilirubin that is the bilirubin which is not bound to the albumin which crosses the brain the anion part of this bilirubin also known as the bilirubin acid combines with the cation of membranes which is the lipids and once it combines it gains access into the cell where it causes mitochondrial dysfunction remember that mitochondria is a powerhouse of the cell so there is energy failure since there is energy failure the active uptake of glutamate ceases and glut glutamate starts to get accumulated so glutamate is an excitotoxic neurotransmitter 
it acts on the NMDA receptors, which causes calcium entry into the cell. And this calcium entry into the cell causes various activation of secondary pathways leading to necrosis. There is also release of cytochrome C from the mitochondria, which activates the caspase pathway leading to apoptosis. It primarily affects the neurons and the astrocytes. Coming to the first step, that is prevent severe jaundice. It holds true, especially for preventing RH isomerization, which is still a major cause of severe jaundice in our population. Each and every baby before discharge should be assessed clinically or with the help of transcutaneous bilirubinometer. Before discharge, each baby should be assessed for adequacy of breastfeeding, weight gain. There are certain risk groups like late preterm and yeast deficiency, which are prone to develop high jaundice and they should be followed up early and for g speed deficiency, especially in places where it is common, we should advise for newborn screening at birth. Now, how to prevent RH isomerization? Now, coming to the RH immunization, still in today's era, there are around 16 thousand mothers who remain untreated every year. That means more than 150 per day of the mothers have RH assimilization, which is hu a huge number. And if they receive NTD, this problem of RH assimilization can be totally curbed. Therefore, all mothers should be screened at booking with the help of blood group. And if they are negative, and their partner is positive, they should undergo antibody titers and Doppler scanning. Whenever a baby is born to such mothers, you should, the baby should have a cord blood group, TSB, hematocrit, and all such mothers should receive NTD within 72 hours of birth. Before discharging neonate, we should assess them for the risk factors. The major risk factors include early jaundice, premature birth, hemolytic disease, presence of bruising, yeast station race, and exclusive breastfeeding. Here in the index case, we had three major risk factors, but since we did not stratify him, we missed to follow upon this baby. Other common method of pre-discharge screening is using a transcutaneous bilirubinometer with the help of bilirubinometer or which is one is shown in the picture. It is effective for babies more than 34 weeks after 24 hours of life and is quite reliable. However, in cases of severe jaundice, that is a jaundice of more than 14 to 15 milligram per day, it is not reliable and should always be confirmed with serum bilirubin. Based on transcutaneous bilirubin, the babies can be categorized into various zones. That is the low risk zone, low intermediate, high intermediate, and the high risk zone. And depending on the level of the bilirubin, which is plotted on the y-axis and age is plotted on the x-axis, if the baby falls in the high risk zone, there is 40% of chances that baby is going to develop severe jaundice. It has a high neg negative predictive value and sensitivity of around 100%, whereas <clears throat> positive to predictive value is only 40%. Based on the risk stratification, the high risk should not be discharged and should remain within the hospital and they should be followed up with a serum bilirubin after 6 to 12 hours. Whereas the intermediate group can be discharged and called for follow-up in a day or two. You should also, before discharge, should also focus on proper latching, positioning, we should supervise the weight gain pattern. A weight loss of one to three percent per day is normal, and usually, majority of the term and preterm babies they regain birth weight by seven to ten days. Late preterms are prone to develop jaundice because of the various risk factors, including polycythemia. Therefore, they should be followed up early. Areas where GSPD prevalence is high, we should stress on newborn screening to identify these babies early. Now, how can we prevent progression? of jaundice to bind. This includes management of RH isomerized fetuses, aggressive 
and early detection of jaundice and treating them appropriately with either phototherapy or exchange transfusion wherever required. This is also known as the crash cart approach. That is babies who have a jaundice of high jaundice of 20 or more, they should be started on intensive phototherapy and simultaneously one should prepare for exchange transfusion. In RH isomerized fetus, the monitoring and management should begin in the antenatal period with the help of serial scanning of the mother with the help of MCA Doppler. And once there is a Doppler shows MCA PSV goes more than 1.5 multiples of median, we should the mother should undergo an intrauterine transfusion. And whenever there are features of high drops despite intrauterine transfusions, we should deliver the baby. Now, one should always use appropriate charts to manage phototherapy, to minimize variations and to start phototherapy early. One such chart is given by AAP for babies who are 35 weeks or more. For babies who are less than 35 weeks, we usually use nice charts. In this chart, there are three risk groups. One is the lowest is the high risk group. Then we have medium risk group and the lower risk group. On the x-axis, we have age and on the y-axis, we have serum bilirubin. For Indian babies, because of their genetic and racial factors, we always take the baby as medium risk, even if there is no risk factor. The common risk factors included in this, these guidelines are isoimmune hemolytic anemia, g 6 deficiency, asphyxia, lethargy, temperature instability, sepsis, acidosis, or bilirubin less than three milligrams, three grams per day. Our, why is our population at high risk of carnitus is because of the higher incidence of G6PD deficiency. We have high proportion of IUGR SGA babies and they tend to have polycythemia and high jaundice. Because of the hot summers and erratic feeding, babies can have dehydration which can increase the jaundice further. Often the babies are preferred late. Phototherapy units may not be optimal. And second, because of the genetic and the racial factors. Phototherapy remains the mainstay of the therapy. We should use a dose of at least 10 to 15 microwatts per centimeter square per nanometer. And remember that higher the iridance, better is its effect. The common effective wavelength is blue-green spectrum. And among all the phototherapies, that is LED fluorescent blue blanket, LED remains the most effective because it provides the high iridance, has long lamp life, less glare, and generates less heat. There is no role of fluid supplementation for jaundice. Only in hypervolumina, where which requires double volume exchange transfusion, IV fluid may be considered while averting exchange transfusion. IVIG, which used to be a norm in isoimmune hemolytic anemias is no more recommended because there is evidence does not show any benefit. In fact, IVIG in itself is associated with various complications like febrile reaction, rash, hypotension, and it also requires slow infusion and monitoring. Exchange remains most effective way of decreasing jaundice. Any baby who shows signs of bind should undergo a double volume exchange transfusion even if the bilirubin levels are decreasing. The commonest technique used is push-pull technique and we use double volume exchange transfusion because it replaces almost 85% of the blood volume and the bilirubin level is decreased by almost 50% of the pre-exchange levels. Like for phototherapy, similarly, AAP, that is American Academy of Pediatrics, has charts for exchange transfusion where you can see that this is the age in the x-axis and then we have total serum, serum bilirubin values on the y-axis. Now, when to stop phototherapy? Stop Phototherapy can be stopped whenever the bilirubin is less than 3 milligrams per DL below the cutoff value as per NICE or AAP charts. Single value is sufficient to continue phototherapy. However, in babies who have hemolytic jaundice, two consecutive values below phototherapy range should be documented before stopping phototherapy. Now, how can we prevent bind to progress to carnitus? This can be 
done with the help of proper neurological examination at the time of discharge. Look for hypotonia, poor suck, persistence of ADNR. Para should be done for all babies at three months of age. And these babies should be followed up for features of dystonic CP, choreothetoid movements, upward gaze palsy, enamel hypoplasia, and should be followed up at least till 18 months of age. In summary, the risks, the risk assessment should begin in the antenatal period, especially for the RH negative mothers with the help of blood group, antibody titer, and Doppler scanning. All babies preterm and term should undergo a pre-discharge jaundice risk assessment based on either PCB or clinical score. Always before discharge, we should ensure establishment of optimal, optimal feeding and weight gain. We should always treat the baby and not the report. And all the babies who are discharged early should be followed up as per unit protocol. Thank you.